Hello, good people. It's great to be back with you. This is part two of my video that I did about my own spiritual experience. I want to thank everybody who made such uh, lovely comments on that video. I was very um, encouraged and very touched by some of the comments that were made. I really um, very much appreciate it. And I said in that video that I wanted to follow up on that video about my experience and dive a little more deeply into this question of spiritual experiences and psychotechnologies that we have all been following with such great interest because of the terrific work of John Brabeke. So what I want to do is put my own experience into question and by so doing, kind of interrogate this whole phenomenon just a little bit. And I hope you'll be along with me for that ride, okay? So there's four areas that I want to explore, and that is authority. What is the authority of these kind of personal um, spiritual experiences, or as John Brevecki might put it, contact with the sacred? And... Um, how can they be seen in the context of their authority, which might be personal or communal, of course, is going to be in a context which would influence both the authority that they, these experiences may have and influence their interpretation. And also, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the problem of manipulation. So when I had my experience, my encounter that led me out of the Jehovah's Witnesses, my interpretation of it was that I had met Jesus Christ and that possibly the experience that I had is the kind of experience that I had heard Christians speak about as a born again experience. Now, in the Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't use that kind of language, and we're not, people are not expected to have that sort of experience. So I was kind of vague in my mind about what exactly the experience was. And although I knew that it was Christ that I had met, I did not really know who he was. I did not have propositional knowledge that you would have um, in an orthodox Christian situation. However, I do live in the social context of Christianity, and Jehovah's Witnesses do claim to be Christians, and they do have a version of the Bible that they read. So even though I didn't have the propositional knowledge of what you might call orthodox Christianity, I did not, was not interpreting my experience in some other religious context, all right? Later on, I entered the Catholic Church, and that was after moving through several Christian denominations. And I, within those Christian denominations, there are varying interpretations of what, in Catholicism, I've come to learn to call this private revelation, all right? So different denominations of Christians have different attitudes toward this phenomena of private revelation. However, I do want to say that it is a common experience among Christians to have these kinds of experiences. Um, among some Christian denominations, these kinds of experiences are considered to be something to be sought after. And, um, you know, that might lead to manipulation. I'll talk about that in a minute. Within Catholicism, these experiences are of are common, but their authority that they have does not extend beyond the individual person to whom they occur, except in extraordinary cases. So to give some examples of this, many of the founders of various religious 
orders within Catholicism. You might think of things like the Benedictines or the, um, the Franciscans, etc. Many of the founders of religious groups within the Catholic Church had intense and significant personal experiences, personal spiritual experiences that led them to accumulate around them people who wanted to follow in the uh, in a particular way of life that they believed was being revealed to them by by god however within the catholic church these kinds of experiences when there is an attempt to extend the authority of the experience out beyond the individual and to possibly creating some kind of group based on it is subject to the discernment of the hierarchy of the church. So um, one example of this might be the activity of Mother Teresa. So Mother Teresa, who was serving as, um, as a nun in India, had an experience of Christ <coughs> saying to her, I thirst. And she understood this to have as having something to do with her way of serving the poorest of the poor. Now, after her initial experience and her initial foundation of beginning her ministry to the poor, she then went through a very extended period of time lasting many decades where she had no experience of uh, having um, of, of what we call spiritual consolation or spiritual contact with Christ. And yet her initial experiences that she had that set her on her path were so profound and she was so faithful to them that on the basis of them, she continued her work for many, many years. So um, people who have such spiritual experiences don't always have them in any kind of continuous basis. They may be a rare one time or very, um, very infrequent event. Some people have them, you know, many times over the course of many years of their life. Right. Now, um, this so within Christ, various Christian denominations, the way that these experiences are interpreted and the authority that they have may vary. So they may only have authority or have a significance for an individual person. In some cases, they may extend to having authority for a small group that is around those, that person. In other cases, perhaps an entire congregation of Christians may um, view the private revelations of a member of their con particular congregation. And here I'm using congregations kind of like as analogous to kind of like parish or, or a single individual church rather than, you know, kind of like a, a Catholic way of using the word congregation more official or hierarchical. Or there may be that even in an entire denomination of Christians, many um, thousands of them are swayed and influenced by one person's private revelation. So it's highly variable within Christian context um, how these particular um, experiences are viewed and what kind of authority they have. It's also variable as to how the relationship is between the individual and the hierarchy or structure of the church and to what degree a person is expected to um, submit their private revelation for discernment to the church body. Now this brings up the question of manipulation because obviously if you have a situation where people um, can have or are expected to have certain kinds of spiritual experiences, there is always the chance that people could be manipulated into having certain experiences. Now, one example of this would be um, something um, a man told me about being part of a denomination 
where people would be baptized and it was expected that when you came up out of the water it was baptism by immersion that when you came up out of the water you would be speaking in tongues if you were really baptized <laughs> and um, and so that led to a lot of manipulation and people trying to have this experience of speaking in tongues however i do know for a fact that manipulation of spiritual experiences expectations of people having certain experiences and the ability of people to manipulate others into thinking they have such experiences is not in any way unique to christian context i know that it happens in the context in other religious contexts and even in the non-theistic religions i know that because um when i after i left the jehovah's witnesses i did quite a bit of study of cults and i talked to people who were in cults of all different sorts including meditation cults and cults where they were expected to do things like um like levitate <laughs> all right so if somebody can make you think you're levitating then um you know that's a pretty it's pretty much of a manipulation too right okay so when you put all of this stuff together um there's some things that become clear for one thing encounters with the sacred or or revelations from god have nothing say nothing about the goodness or holiness etc of the person to whom these things happen okay i can use myself as an example of that because i was not particularly holy in any way when i had my encounter with christ so it's not it doesn't say anything about the person it doesn't say anything about their um anything about them in terms of their uh, virtue to have an encounter like this any more than when Jesus Christ was walking around um, on the earth in Judea and Galilee and he was uh, running into people that the fact that he encountered people said something about their holiness they were just the ordinary run of the lot of humanity all right um, encounters with god spiritual experiences trans transcendental experiences whatever you want to call them also may have no connection or no effect on a person that would result in a personal transformation and i actually know of a situation that illustrates this very well so years ago i knew a guy who was um quite a bit a lot younger than I, than myself and was a pretty dissolute character um, uh, but in spite of being of little personal accomplishment he had a very very high opinion of himself he always thought he was the smartest person in the room and he was also very uh, kind of arrogantly flippant and dismissive of religion and one time in conversation with him I said you know you're so sure that there's no god what you ought to do someday is just ask i said you got nothing to lose you don't believe there will be any answer you don't believe there's a god what you ought to do is just say god if you're there reveal yourself to me and see what happens well you know i had forgotten all about doing that it was a long time after i think it was a period of years later and he happened to come to me and he said this he said that he was working under a truck i think he was doing a brake job or something and he was working under a truck and um he happened to remember what i said and he said in kind of a flippant way um you know kind of like god i don't believe in you but if you happen to be real let, you know let me know that you're there and he had an experience he had he heard and he doesn't know if it if anyone else there would have heard it but to him he heard a voice say i am so strongly that it was like an earthquake and it shook him to the core of his being now he told me about this experience and he told me that he now knew that there was a god 
that there was no nothing could ever convince him he was as convinced now that there was a god as he had been convinced that there was not a god and that for the rest of his life he would never again you know be take the atheist position or mock anyone who believed in god however this had no effect at all on him in terms of the way he was living his life he remained the same dissolute person that he was before he was still just as completely irresponsible in all of his personal relationships and responsibilities of life as ever he was uh you know completely given over to vices and um and just just a complete reprobate he never pursued any kind of spiritual spirituality he never pursued religion he never tried to you know make um you know get into some sort of right relationship with this god who had let him know that that he was there so it had no it had no connection in in his case with any kind of personal transformation and on top of that personal transformation and acquisition of wisdom can occur in settings in which no one, not the person to whom it happens, nor any outside observer would say were religious settings um, or have any connection to spirituality or any connection to some sort of psychotechnology of the kind that John Verveke is um, pursuing, um, you know, helping people get established in, all right? It, and this can happen in a context which is theistic or non-theistic or completely non-religious. Sometimes these personal transformations happen when someone has to go through a particularly intense struggle to accomplish something. It may happen when um, someone suffers through some sort of a personal crisis or personal or something like an illness or they have to overcome some physical, terrible physical obstacle um some sort of suffering or trial or it can just be quite absent from any of this so i'll give you an example of this this is the, the example of uh dietrich von hildebrand dietrich von hildebrand was a catholic um theologian and philosopher in the um, 20th century and i had a conversation about his work with Sevilla king on her channel and so i'll put a link to that so you can learn a little more about him but um he grew up and i can't remember exactly what city i'm thinking he may have grown up in vienna um he grew up in a completely secular family no religious background whatsoever and his family was quite aristocratic very well known and well respected um and his father was a very well known artist a sculptor his father um in the course of making his sculptures would use uh female models and had remarked on more than one occasion that uh, regardless of how lovely these models were he had never seen a perfect female body well one day he um, came into the house from his workshop and he announced to his family that he had finally found a model who was in his mind the perfect female body the perfect embodiment of feminine beauty and perfection and this nude model was in his workshop you know right now and he invited his family to come and behold her. And uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand himself was at this time 13 years old, 13 year old boy. And um, while his mother and sisters went to look at this young woman, Dietrich demurred and he said that he wished to not look upon a naked female until his own wedding night now consider what um what extraordinary precocious wisdom at this is showing up in this 13 year old boy how many 13 year old boys do you think would have passed up that opportunity and yet he had somehow this um this wisdom uh 
that he wanted to keep the mystery of sexuality and um, the feminine mystique, you might say, he wanted to keep that enclosed within the bounds of marriage. And this was without any kind of religious upbringing, purely having a secular upbringing. So you can see that wisdom can come to people in ways that have nothing at all to do with um, the psychotechnologies or spiritualities at all. Now, the reason, of course, that John Brubeke is exploring all these psychotechnologies and we're having this conversation in our little corner of the internet is because John Brubeke is desiring to, um, to equip people with tools that have kind of been vetted by cognitive science because he wants a reliable method of delivering wisdom to people. Okay. Now, what I want to say about that is that religions do have a reliable method. And I want to propose that the reliable method that religions have for delivering wisdom to people is through laws, rules, and rituals. Now, what I'm talking about here is not just the problem that we have spoken about before, which Paul Vanderclay has addressed with John Verbeke, and John Verbeke has um, also encountered in his conversations with other people. It's not merely the problem of scalability, all right? The scalability issue is the issue of, okay, John Verbeke, you're doing this project, which is very, um, very extensive, it's very elaborate, it's very elaborated in the sense of being laid out, and, um, and it looks difficult to deliver down the entire social economic strata to various socioeconomic levels, just because of the amount of education it takes. It also looks difficult to deliver on developmental levels, meaning, you know, people of various ages and uh, different levels of, of personal development in the way that, for example, Christians have Bible stories for children, that kind of thing. And it also looks difficult to deliver at various at levels of educational attainment. However, I do know that John Verbeke is very well aware of that problem of scalability and is working on it in some very creative ways. One of the ways would be with people who are um, dealing with martial arts, for example. And martial arts, as we all know, even young children can get involved in martial arts. So, um, so, some of the, so he's aware of these problems and he is definitely addressing them and, um, and discussing and discussing them and coming up with creative solutions. And as he would say, it's not just him, it's the people around him that are all working on this. But I am not talking here about the scalability issue, although I do think it is not an issue that is fully resolved in what John Verbeke is doing. I'm talking about something different. What I'm talking about is the distillation of wisdom into a very um, concentrated form. Now, religion does this by means of rules and laws, okay? Um, people don't like this. <laughs> they don't like it because if you ask them, like if you ask a person who's not religious and you say, well, what do you have against religion or why would you not pursue religion? They'll they'll usually say one of two things they'll say i can't i can't stomach all those unbelievable stories you know that's the mythos part or they'll say i can't take all those rules i don't need all these rules all right uh, i think about paul vanderclay he recently did a video with, um, where he talked about richard dawkins mentioning uh, being offended by the ten commandments being posted up in public buildings you know and and Paul Vanderclay was asking, well, what if the what commandment do you have a, a problem with? 
well, and he said, you know, um, Richard Dawkins is an atheist, so he might have a problem with the commandments about um, wor about worshiping God and taking God's name in vain. But that he probably thought all the other commandments were were good. He probably wouldn't have a problem with the other commandments. Well, <laughs> I think that I think that really a lot of people do have the problem with the commandment against adultery and. Here's the reason why. The commandment to worship God and the commandment not to commit adultery are really talking about the same thing, all right? Because unfaithfulness to God is adultery, and adultery is unfaithfulness to God. I'm going to go even further. I'm going to say that fornication is adultery. And to most people, the rule in religion against fornication to them seems like utter nonsense. Okay, so why is it that fornication is adultery? Well, it's because a person has an aspirational self, just like John Verveke has been talking about. The aspirational self is real. Your future self already exists in God. And so does the future self of the person that you're having sex with. And so does the future self, aspirational self of their future spouse and your future spouse. This is why fornication is actually adultery you're still having sex with someone else's spouse if you're committing fornication even if neither of you is currently married so as john paul ii said fornication is a lie that you are telling with your body now Instead of making the pattern of reality clear and um, demonstrating to people through the argumentation and the elaboration of the philosophy and the psychology and the understanding of these things and training, giving the training in self-control and virtue, this wisdom, which manifest the sacred character of the human family gets distilled into laws. And the laws look like things like, thou shalt not commit adultery, do not commit fornication. And then the question is, in John Verveke's system as he imagines it with his psychotechnologies, what is it that is going to support the sacredness of family life. I don't really know. I wonder how he would answer that. Guy Sunstock was recently in conversation with Paul Vanderclay. And, and he talked, the two of them talked about marriage. It was a really lovely conversation. And um, Guy Sunstock said, hey, there's really something to this marriage stuff. Now he had a girlfriend on and off relationship with her for about 10 years and they got married about a year ago and it completely transformed their relationships transformed him and he is very amazed by what marriage has done for him and for them and their relationship but someone who simply followed the law who simply followed the rules of christian christianity got the same benefit. They got it faster and with less pain. They already established their family and maybe they've already started having kids while Guy Singstock was figuring this out. And I'm not putting him down by any means. I think he's, he's wonderful and I think it's great what all of the things he said. But nevertheless, I suggest to you that following the law of a theistic religion that tells you how to live is more rational 
then Guy Sangstock figuring out at figuring it out on his own, or and certainly more rational than all of this experimentation that's going on out in our society and is wreaking havoc in people's lives. Now, why do I say it's more rational? Well, John Varecki was in a conversation with um, Andrew Sweeney. It was really a great conversation, and I'll link to it in the description. But they got into a com they got into a discussion about rationality and what John Verveke, how John Verveke would define rationality. And um, so Andrew Sweeney said that he was um, listening to something or reading something by Ian McGilchrist, and that Ian McGilchrist defined rationality as breaking things apart. And um, to me, I would call that analysis and the, the form of reasoning that you use when you break things into parts, I would say, is analysis of what, um, what Robert Percy would call the analytical knife, okay? And I would say, before I listened to their conversation, I would have said that rationality has to do with ratio and proportion portion that um, seeing things in their proper proportion and making proper judgments about them. Now, John Verveke had an interesting definition of rationality. And what he talked about was that we have to use our rationality in order to make the commitment of our finite uh, cognitive resources to things. So because there's so many things to pay attention to and we have to decide, you know, relevance, realization, we have to decide what to pay attention to. And, um, and we have to act in the world, we have to constantly make decisions and we're faced with finite resources that we have to portion them out and figure out what we're going to use our finite resources for and that the ability to do this cognitively is that is the essence of rationality okay so i thought that was a very interesting way of defining it and thinking about what rationality is and when i had my conversation my first conversation with john verbeke i talked to him about having a particular spiritual problem and this had to do with um this had to do with something I had seen on television and my reaction to it, my feeling like I was not reacting to it properly and wanting to readjust my own attitude. And I talked to him about how, what would he do using his psychotechnologies, using his uh, spiritual practices, how, would, how does he handle this type of thing in his own life when he perceives about himself that he needs to make a change? And then I told him what I did. Okay, now my practice, the way that I handled it was extremely simple. In terms of cognitive resources, it took very little. What John Verbeke elaborated on his practice was extremely um, big. It was big in terms of time. It was big in terms of the kind of learning that you would have to do to be able to implement it, et cetera. So I'm going to make the case here that given John Verveke's own definition of rationality as um, how we apportion our finite resources, that my method of dealing with it was more rational than his was. I'm not saying his was bad or anything like that, but I'm just using his definition. Things that are, that are simpler and more direct are really more rational in most cases because they're making better use of the finite resources. So following the laws or rules of a religion may actually be the most rational thing to do, both on the individual level and also in terms of a society. So what if we were to begin to see these laws and rules of the theistic religions as rational? 
well, we're still stuck with all the other stuff, right? Like the unbelievable mythos that doesn't fit into the scientific worldview. We still got a problem with that. So how can theistic religions get past that in particular, especially Christianity? How do we get past that? Well, I'm going to make one more video in this little series about spiritual experiences. And um, in this um, next video, what I want to do is I want to propose a fifth way of knowing to go along with John Vervecki's four Ps that he's got. Okay, he's got propositional, perspectival, procedural, and participatory knowing and this has been great having him um, speak about those things and go into detail about the function of those kinds of knowing because it really has opened up a lot of our eyes to things that we've been doing that we didn't even realize we were doing including within our religious practices um, so i want to talk about what i think that there i think there's another way of knowing that john Rebecca has left out and I'm going to talk about that in my next video. And I also want to elaborate a bit more on my comment about adultery, how adultery is unfaithfulness to God and unfaithfulness to God is adultery because it ties in with that um, fifth way of knowing that I'm going to propose. So I hope that you'll be back with me for that. I'll be very interested to see what John Rubicki has to say about my proposing another way of knowing. Until we are together again, treat yourself as though you are someone you are responsible for helping because you are responsible. So am I, and together we are making the world. Bye for now. Thanks so much for watching.